Um, so we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension, the setting of connective tissue disease. Most of the data that I'm going to show you pertains particularly to scleroderma. And, you know, just to show a little data behind that, this is um, post-marketing surveillance in Europe right after Bocentin was launched, about the first 5,000 patients or so. You can see that 36% of that cohort had idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, and nearly a third had connective tissue disease-related pulmonary arterial hypertension. And of those, the vast majority, 75%, were scleroderma patients with a smattering of patients with lupus and mixed connective tissue disease. I recently looked at the connective tissue disease pulmonary hypertension patients here at the Cleveland Clinic. And they made up 11% of our 2,000 plus patients that had right heart cath proven pulmonary hypertension with an adjudicated diagnosis. And of those, scleroderma was the lion's share. But we could see pulmonary arterial hypertension in lupus and mixed connective tissue disease, but it can be seen in all of our underlying rheumatologic diseases, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, rheumatoid arthritis. We see it in Sjogren's syndrome. So it is a complication in all of our connective tissue diseases. And because of that, a connective tissue disease screen is part of the essential testing when you're evaluating your patient for pulmonary hypertension. And when I think of, you know, what do I do for a connective tissue disease screen, I certainly ask a very detailed review of systems. I ask about dry eyes, dry mouth, reflux, oral nasal ulcers, Raynaud phenomenon. Um, I also do a good, you know, head-to-toe examination. And on laboratory testing, I get an, I get an ANA and um, antiphospholipid antibodies. I... We'll get other serologic testing if there's something in the history that makes me think of another connective tissue disease. And because pulmonary hypertension is so prevalent in scleroderma, we actually have a cohort that has a risk factor for pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is a group that screening is recommended. And so most experts feel that patients with scleroderma should get at least a yearly echocardiogram to evaluate for the possible presence of pulmonary hypertension. And in today's era, pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease are the leading causes of mortality, not only in scleroderma, but our other rheumatologic diseases. And so, you know, there's more emphasis on trying to figure out how to recognize and treat pulmonary hypertension in connective tissue disease to decrease this morbidity and mortality. And consequently, in 2013, the scleroderma classification system was revised. Um, the old system did not mention pulmonary hypertension. You could have interstitial lung disease as one of your minor criteria, um, but the old classification system really neglected the vasculopathy that's so common in scleroderma. And now it's recognized as one of the key criteria for the diagnosis of scleroderma, needing nine criteria to get a definite diagnosis with a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 92%, nine, nine points with pulmonary arterial hypertension giving you two points. And, you know, with our connective tissue diseases, particularly scleroderma, it's not um, surprising that we see pulmonary vasculopathy. We have, see a similar pathology in um, Raynaud's phenomenon. This is a, a, a digital vessel in a patient with a digital ischemia digital ulcer, which has very similar pathology to a patient with scleroderma renal crisis, to very similar pathology to a patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension, which as you heard from Dr. Farver, is, is slightly different from patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So there's been a lot of attempt to figure out what the exact prevalence is of pulmonary arterial hypertension, particularly in the scleroderma mixed connective tissue disease cohort. And this is probably one of the more famous um, 
prevalence studies, although it really doesn't answer the question because this is an echo study and you've already heard um, from Dr. Chason about the importance of right heart catheterization. But in this study, patients greater than 18 years of age with scleroderma or mixed connective tissue disease had a retrospective review of their charts. There were 815 patients. And in that cohort, 15% had an existing diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Those patients without a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension were then offered an echocardiogram, and they found another 13.3% that had a systolic pulmonary artery pressure greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, giving a total prevalence of nearly you know, a quarter of the patients having an elevated right ventricular systolic pressure. Now, echo, again, is our best screening, but not you know, a... Um, not the gold standard for diagnosis, and we don't know whether these patients also have underlying interstitial lung disease or diastolic or even systolic dysfunction. So um, in this study, patients actually underwent heart catheterization. Um, actually, these are two different studies that looked at um, the risk of developing pulmonary arterial hypertension um, with two-year follow-up. And here, the largest study is on the right, where you can see that of 361 patients, nearly a quarter had mild to moderate pulmonary arterial hypertension, and about 13% had severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, with some sort of similar data in a much smaller study of 35 patients. And I think we now believe that the, the prevalence of pulmonary arterial hypertension in you know, significant pulmonary arterial hypertension in scleroderma is somewhere between 10 and, and, and 15%. Clinical risk factors for the development of pulmonary hypertension patients with scleroderma. Traditionally, we thought these are our patients with CREST, or limited cutaneous scleroderma. However, now there's been some recent data suggesting that the prevalence of pulmonary arterial hypertension may be um, just as great in patients with diffuse cutaneous um, scleroderma. Traditionally, we have thought that patients with long disease duration, greater than eight to 10 years of duration of Raynaud phenomenon, were more at risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension. New data has shown that it can occur within the first five years of disease or be a presenting symptom. Patients with extensive telangiectasia seem to have some increased risk. So there is some association with various antibodies in scleroderma. Um, the anti-centromere antibody um, tends to be highly prevalent in patients with both pulmonary arterial hypertension but also pulmonary venous hypertension, and tends to not be so prevalent in patients with pulmonary hypertension related to interstitial lung disease. This is in contrary to the SCL70, which is highly prevalent in patients with interstitial lung disease, and considered sort of a, a, a negative risk factor for the development of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Patients with a nucleolar antibody have a higher risk of pulmonary, both pulmonary arterial and pulmonary venous hypertension, as well as a few other antibodies. But the nucleolar antibody and the anti-centromere antibodies are the ones that generally get my attention. One of the um, predictors of pulmonary arterial hypertension scleroderma is diffusion capacity. And this is how um, had a lot of attention in scleroderma, probably more so than in idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is one of the first studies that kind of highlighted diffusion, where a diffusion kind of 40% is kind of kind of the number we, we think of. A diffusion of 40% or less, which is pretty bad, really makes one want to look especially hard for the presence of pulmonary hypertension. And not only might it be a reason for a rheumatologist or even a pulmonologist to screen their patients for, for pulmonary hypertension, but it has been shown that it can be potentially a surrogate endpoint to kind of follow the integrity of the vascular bed. And these are 
um, some, you know, data looking at um, survival and pulmonary arterial hypertension based on baseline diffusion capacity with pa patients with that diffusion, again, less than 40% having a much worse survival characteristics. And Dr. Pramble alluded to the FVC to diffusion ratio, which is not particularly helpful in other forms of um, group three um, pulmonary hypertension like COPD and, and IPF, but it has been a, a number that has been used quite often in scleroderma, and that's because interstitial lung disease is, is quite common in scleroderma as well, and so sometimes patients have pulmonary hypertension in addition to their interstitial lung disease, and when you see a diffusion kind of dropping out of proportion to their forced vital capacity, you start to think, you know, could they have pulmonary vascular disease as well? So an elevated FVC to diffusion ratio, greater than 1.8, some people use 1.6, I've seen as low as 1.4, but a diffusion that's down out of proportion to the FVC certainly has a much worse survival than patients with a um, more balanced FVC to diffusion ratio. We use the six minute walk test. This is um, one of my favorite, actually my favorite patient from Charleston, South Carolina, and my favorite respiratory therapist from Charleston, South Carolina. We use the six minute walk test as you know our a surrogate endpoint, just like we do in other forms of pulmonary hypertension. Um, and but there's some caveats in that sometimes there are limitations in the six minute walk that are not cardiopulmonary related. You know their knee hurts or you know they have muscle weakness. You know I tend to inject everybody's knees before their six minute walk to take care of some of that, but. Um, you know, we also, you know, th there's limitation in oximetry using the finger probe because of their, their Raynaud phenomenon. But it's been shown that seeing a decrease in six-minute walk test over time suggests the presence of pulmonary hypertension um, um, and also suggests, you know, a, a worsening of clinical symptoms as well as a decrease in oxygen saturation during the six minute walk test. And here you can see, this is data from the Ferros database, which is a, a prevalence and incidence study of pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma. And that you can see this drop of, you know, 60 um, meters in the six minute walk really suggested that the patient was gonna end up with a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension treatment can show some improvement, and then again, decline in walk distance um, shows um, significant worsening, which we would hope for in, in a value that we are using as a surrogate endpoint. Um, but because some of our patients don't walk well, there's been interest in other, other endpoints, and the, both the BNP and the NT Pro BNP um, are one of those endpoints. Um, in this study, in NT pro BNP of greater than 395 had a 56% sensitivity and a 95% specificity for the presence of scleroderma related pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this had a tighter correlation with pulmonary vascular resistance um, than with an R value of 0.81 than it did with a six minute walk distance, where it's inversely correlated with six minute walk distance. So we talked a lot about scleroderma. I just kind of wanted to run through some risk factors, just one slide on risk factors for pulmonary hypertension in lupus. Um, probably about one to 4% of patients with lupus are at risk for developing pulmonary arterial hypertension. Typically, they are females. They also have an isolated reduction diffusion capacity and rate no phenomenon. Sometimes reading the literature, I wonder if these are a little bit of a scleroderma spectrum of disease. They often have renal disease, digital gangrene, cutaneous vasculitis, or levito reticularis. They also have a number of antibodies suggesting just an overall um, breakdown of immune tolerance with you know positive rheumatoid factors, antiribonuclear protein. Again, that's sort of a 
the scleroderma and mixed connective tissue disease antibody, antiphospholipid antibodies, and anti-endothelial antibodies. But the reason pulmonary hypertension and connective tissue disease is so challenging is that you can see pretty much all of our WHO um, groups. Group one, group one prime is probably under-recognized in this group of patients, so the pulmonary venal occlusive disease. Um, we see plenty of left-sided heart disease, valvular heart disease, diastolic dysfunction, uh, even systolic dysfunction. There's plenty of interstitial lung disease. Some of the other connective tissue diseases are associated with an obstructive or a mixed and um, restrictive and obstructive ventilatory defects. And these patients are not immune to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So just because you've diagnosed your patient with scleroderma, don't forget to get the VQ scanner. Dr. Horaci will come find you. Um, but uh, there's probably an incidence, 17% incidence of antiphospholipid antibodies in scleroderma. So it's important to you know, do due diligence and complete the pulmonary hypertension workup even when you think you're dealing with a connective tissue disease. And this is the reality though. Not only can they fit in any WHO group, but sometimes I feel like they're overlapping and I don't know, is it more their interstitial lung disease or is it more pulmonary arterial hypertension or what about their diastolic dysfunction? And I think that makes it the real challenge in trying to tease out how to treat these patients. We certainly know that um, patients with interstitial lung disease and scleroderma often get pulmonary hypertension. About a quarter or about 40% of patients with mild restriction can have pulmonary hypertension. And this is almost half of patients with severe restriction have pulmonary hypertension. In addition, of pulmonary hypertension to interstitial lung disease really um, drives mortality in this group of patients. You know, this is a CT scan of someone with pulmonary venal occlusive disease. So although it is important to get the VQ scan, I think there is a role for HRCT in the patient with connective tissue disease because they have uh, increased incidence of interstitial lung disease. But it's important to recognize um, whether they might have pulmonary venal occlusive disease. I just saw a patient um, a couple weeks ago that came from quite a distance, um, and this, this is what she had. Um, she had had long standing, she has long standing scleroderma, and her CT scan looks almost exactly like this. CT scan also might make you think of a connective tissue disease if you see features like a, like a patulous esophagus, for instance, or maybe some, some pleural involvement as well. So when you are looking for pulmonary venal occlusive disease, there's a, a diagnostic triad, which includes lymphadenopathy, central lobular ground glass opacities, which you can see here if it projects well enough, and then septal lines, sometimes some pleural fusion as well. Just like there's an overlap with interstitial lung disease, there's often an overlap with um, diastolic dysfunction or abnormalities of the left side of the heart. And when you look at patients that are idiopathic versus patients with scleroderma, with similar hemodynamics on echocardiogram, you can see that there tends to be an increased left atrial size as well as a higher percentage of left ventricular hypertrophy and a greater prevalence of diastolic dysfunction and pericardial effusion despite very similar hemodynamics, right, right heart catheterization. And we know that there's fibrosis in the, in the myocardium, just like we see fibrosis in the skin in scleroderma patients. Here are um, predictors of mortality in scleroderma-related pulmonary arterial hypertension from the REVEAL registry. And here you can see that patients with a older age, I won't say advanced, but a little bit older than me, um, more advanced functional class. Um, you can see um, a l decreased six-minute walk distance and elevated BNP. Um, the typical elevated right atrial pressure and that 
as well as markedly elevated pulmonary vascular resistance are risk factors. So African American race is not 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 on this list and hasn't been shown um, to be a specific risk factor. I think Dr. Chason mentioned and and um, something about the TAPSI score um, being. Um, predictive of outcomes in pulmonary arterial hypertension, and that goes in scleroderma as well. So that's a, a another um, thing that can be looked at in determining survival in patients with scleroderma, with patients with a decreased TAPSI have a worse survival than patients with a more normal TAPSI. Renal dif- dysfunction also is a predictor of poor outcomes, where a decreased GFR is a predictor of increased mortality compared to a more normal GFR. And that might be a reflection of overall cardiac output. And here's the data on a change. We saw a baseline diffusion being a predictor of mortality. But here is data on change in diffusion associated with survival. And you can see patients whose diffusion doesn't change have a much better survival than patients with a decreasing um, diffusion capacity. And unfortunately, you know, connective tissue disease, particularly scleroderma, continues to get a bad rap because their survival curves are just not as good as patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. But we have been able to show that there is some benefit to routine screening for patients with scleroderma. And, that's, and there is data you know, that treating patients as early as you can is a good thing. And so in this study, patients, this was um, a study where they looked at routine screening as opposed to just picking up the pulmonary hypertension based on routine clinical care in patients that underwent systematic screening had a significant improvement in mortality compared to those that were just kind of picked up um, willy-nilly. And that, that makes sense because we know that patients with a more advanced functional class, which is usually when pulmonary hypertension, you know, conks you over the head, um, has a worse survival than patients with less advanced functional class. So it all kind kind of makes sense a little bit. So there are now some guidelines for screening patients with scleroderma for right heart catheterization. And there's been um, a number of recommendations, um, including the European Respiratory Society, the American College of Chest Physicians, American Heart Association, um, and then Dana Point um, actually did not make recommendations. But basically, patients, um, if patients have symptoms, they need a right heart catheterization. If they have scleroderma um, and they have a pulmonary, systolic pulmonary pressure greater than 50, that buys you a right heart catheterization. If you have a pulmonary pressure greater than 50, and you don't have scleroderma, that buys you a right heart catheterization. That's probably just something that you need to investigate a little further. If you have scleroderma, and you're kind of between 37 to 50, then you look for other evidence of pulmonary hypertension on echo, and obviously if they have symptoms, they get a right heart catheterization. If their pulmonary artery pressures are sort of not so bad, but there's some other signs on echo, which is why it's so important not to just look at that number, but to look at the right-sided morpho- morphology and function, like Dr. Chason said. Um, if you see that, and they're symptomatic, and they have scleroderma, they need a right heart catheterization. The American Heart Association says a high right ventricular systolic pressure or right-sided heart chamber enlargement on echo, they need a right heart catheterization. And the American College of Chest Physicians is less strong. Clinical suspicion of pulmonary arterial hypertension on on echo to reveal elevated right ventricular systolic pressure and abnormalities of the right atrium or right ventricle and or pericardial effusion. Well, we thought we needed to do better. And so the DETECT study looked at a two-step pH screening algorithm in patients with scleroderma. (laughs) 
because evidence, evidence based, based on an evidence-based process to improve detection of pH in scleroderma. And so they identified eight factors in a two-step process, and each factor was assigned a point value based on the relative risk of finding pulmonary hypertension. And the step one was, who should we get echocardiograph on? You know, who needs an echo? And then step two would be, who needs a right heart catheterization? So the factors that fell out to detect a referral for echo were many of the things that we've talked about. They looked at an elevated FEC to diffusion ratio, telangiectasias, anti-centromere antibody, elevated NT pro BNP. They also, uric acid actually fell out, and then right axis deviation on EKG. And then, if you got your echo and found an elevated right atrium or an elevated tricuspid regurgitant velocity, that would trigger a right heart catheterization. And what they found was using this detect algorithm, you were less likely to miss a pulmonary hypertension diagnosis. So the overall sensitivity was 96% with a specificity of 48%, overall positive predictive value of 35%, and negative predictive value of 98%. So it's felt that the detect algorithm outperforms the European Respiratory Society guidelines. And so although scleroderma and connective tissue disease-related pulmonary arterial hypertension has a bad rap in comparison to idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, we do know with the advent of our current therapies that we have shown improvement in survival curves. And so I'm not going to show you um, all the data on the different drugs, but scleroderma has been included as a um, disease state in all of the pivotal trials. Most, most of these trials were not, or, or all the trials were not powered to show any difference in the scleroderma-only cohort, but they do show at least a signal that these drugs do work in, in connective tissue disease. I think the most data is in the setting of lupus, and, I'm, and it's still more of like case series data. Um, but here you can see that there's a lot of inflammatory cells around, you know, the pulmonary artery in this patient with an underlying connective tissue disease. So in this study, um, they looked at 23 patients, um, and 16 of them got first-line cyclophosphamide for six months with some prednisone, and then seven of those patients got cyclophosphamide plus some vasodilators. And patients that were responders had improved survival. And they showed that 100% one-year survival, 95% two-year survival, 87% three-year survival, and 87.2 five-year survival. And predictors of survival were cardiac index greater than 3.1 in a less advanced functional class. But based on this study, they recommended that patients with lupus or mixed connective tissue disease be considered for immunosuppressive therapy, those with more advanced um, right heart catheterization findings or functional class would get um, vasodilator therapy as well. So in conclusion, all subtypes of pH may occur in scleroderma patients and may even coexist. Pulmonary arterial connective tissue disease hypertension connective tissue disease is associated with a lower diffusion and higher FEC to diffusion ratio. Pulmonary arterial hypertension in scleroderma is associated with a worse survival compared to idiopathic arterial hypertension or scleroderma alone, and the therapeutic response is blunted. Age, concomitant disease, diminished RV response, and other factors are probably the etiology. Six-minute walk test also has limitations in this population, and early recognition and referral are key.